Symposium for the 20th anniversary of the Elmina Java Museum. If you were here at the inauguration of the museum 20 years ago, then you are now 20 years older. If you were not here, I don't know how old you are. Uh, we would like to also recognize our uh, audience joining us by Zoom from around the world. And uh, we give you a hearty welcome from Elmina. We shall be uh, having what we hope will be a very um, lively program this afternoon, uh, discussing different aspects of history, which is what museums are about. Um, I would like to start off um, just with a bit of a background about the museum. The museum started really on a story of um, hidden history, and that is always uh, what is exciting about history, when you discover elements of your history hidden in plain sight in front of you. Uh, this town is set on three hills, Almina. Almina has three hills. It has San Jago Hill, St. Joseph's Hill, and Java Hill. But for many years, if you ask people why Java Hill was called Java Hill, nobody really could tell you. They would say things like maybe years ago, there were a lot of guava trees there. That sort of thing. There were urban myths about why it was called Java Hill. Anyway, basically, it was called Java Hill because between uh, the early 1800s and the late 1800s, about 3,000 soldiers of Ghanaian and largely Burkina Bay origin were essentially coerced into recruitment into the um, Royal Dutch East Indies Army. There were a few people who were also young men in town who didn't have a job, who thought this would be a reasonable gamble sign a contract, go and fight, and if you don't die, you're free and you get a pension from the Dutch government. So that's how um, uh, this Java Hill came to be. Those soldiers who from Java were plots of land on that hill and started settling there. Um, before we continue, I would definitely like to acknowledge uh, some of, you know, as many of our donors as I can remember because I don't have the list in front of me, but uh, I'd like to um, uh, remember, um, acknowledge uh, Dr. and Mrs. Archery of Toronto, Dr. Ebenezer Archery of Toronto, Dr. Yakin Adere Bigby, uh, late uh, Richard Halskamp, and um, also. Dr. Lou Papa, who have all been original donors who have helped us uh, to get this museum off the ground um, about 20 years ago. So uh, we know that those of you who are in the Americas are 
need your coffee to stay up. But we will definitely try to keep you uh, alive and well uh, as the program goes on. I'm going now to turn over the microphone to Honorable Fritz Barfo, who is my co-chair, uh, who will give you uh, some remarks before Nana uh, arrives, Nana Kobnankatia arrives to do the keynote address. Thank you very much and welcome everybody. Thank you very much, Dr. Olsen. Um, yes, we are 20 years older because 20 years ago, um, I was very much part and parcel of the inauguration of this museum. Um, as a result of some of the activities that this museum initiated, I did a television series on, um, sponsored by the Dutch government on the linkages between um, Ghana, the Netherlands, and um, Suriname. And this was because at the time they were celebrating the 500 years of the contract. I won't go too much into detail because there are experts who will talk about that. So I traveled to the Netherlands and uh, to Suriname where I established the links between the three, the three countries, that, that is including Ghana. And it was, an, uh, it was a very, very exciting time for me. I saw how far the Ghanaian diaspora had gone. And I would like to just um, take you to the Amazon forest where I was flown from the city of Paramaribo, which is the capital of um, Suriname, into the Amazon forest where there were Maroons, who were African slaves, the descendants of African slaves, who had fled into the um, Amazon forest and could not be followed by their captors, uh, the Dutch, and they had a very pure form of uh, African life. And in my interaction with them, I realized that they had words that came from the Yoruba, the Igbo, the Akan, the Ga, and uh, Benin. So, um, in, in, in effect, um, the African diaspora uh, has to know where the source of its inspiration, the source of its soul comes from. And we're talking about museums, we're talking about communities, we're talking about memory. And museums are the repository of the living history of, of people, such as uh, the Africans and uh, their descendants and their cousins in the diaspora. So 20 years ago, um, my kinsman and friend and brother, Dr. Olsen, decided to put this place into motion and it's become a symbol of the fact that our history is not just about a locality, but our history is about spread all around the world. And everywhere you go in this world, I, see that I think there's a touch of Elmina. Uh, he mentioned the uh, Bokinabe and the northern influence. At the time, um, uh, I, I didn't even know that I had uh, relations from that part of the world. And I found out that my grandfather actually was a, um, a, son, uh, a son of a Dagumba lady. Um, can you hear me now? No, uh, it's, it's from the diaspora. They, 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 the sound is not going to them out there. Where's my, my technical man? Because I was born before computers, so I'm a BBC man. Can you hear me now? All right. All right. It's been done. It's been sorted out. Um, I was talking about the fact that um, uh, Elmina, there's a touch of Elmina everywhere in the world, and the diaspora um, should realize that um, museums represent the living history, their culture, and other things. Um, I, I, I mentioned that the, the city of Elmina, the town of Elmina, um, as I said, reaches out far out around the world because it was the major port um, in the Gold Coast at the time before they built 
the deep sea harbors in Tema and in Takradi. And so it is a melting pot of a lot of people. It's a cosmopolitan town and it's reflected in the history. And the only way that we can capture that history is by getting the right kind of information for a museum such as the Java Museum. When I went to the Netherlands, um, I followed up on the Bilanda Itam, and I said I won't go too much into that because they are experts. The Bilanda Itam was the name of the African soldiers who went to Java to fight, and their descendants are very much um, present in Utrecht in um, uh, the Netherlands. And I interviewed some of the families, and it was a a very worthwhile experience, very touching experience when you see people who are relations of yours one way or the other, who have gone through a completely different process and have become, though they are still your relations, they are different people with a different culture, a different mindset, but they rely very much on the history of their antecedents. Uh, so um, here we are, the Java Museum is now 20 years old. And um, we want to go on and on. We want to expand. We want to expand on the exhibits we have. We are calling for pictures that would um, underline the very essence of what the museum is about, the Java Museum, about the soldiers who went to the uh, East Indies and came back and brought important things. And as I said, I don't want to uh, rain on the parade by talking about some of the historical points which are very interesting and I'm sure that the various speakers for that uh, on, the, on the various subjects will enlighten all of you on that. So from there I'd, I'd like you to please listen to the next speakers and enjoy the seminar at hand. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Um, we are just uh, going to take a, a short interlude um, while uh, Nana arrives to give us the, um, the keynote uh, address and then we will introduce our other speakers um, as we go on. So we're going to take a, a short uh, five minute break. Those of you who joined us from the east coast of the United States and central time, I'm sure you need more coffee to uh, Keep keep on with us. So thank you, and uh, we'll, be, we'll be back with you shortly. Sleep, then you would not have realized that Nana Kobnankatia Omanhini of Isikado has joined us. Uh, he has graciously agreed to speak with us today, and uh, we thank him for fitting us into his numerous engagements today and characteristically arriving here on time. <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> so, everybody has a program. Uh, Nana's bio is in the program. I do not want to spend a lot of time 
uh, reading what you have with you. Uh, but needless to say, um, Nana is a well-known and committed Pan-Africanist. He's a traditional um, a ruler, and um, he's also a highly educated gentleman. And we are very pleased to have you join us, Nana. Thank you. That's a very wonderful. Somebody play some fine music, I think. It's more interesting than anything that I'll say. So please let the music flow. You've been gone, it's an empty home. Come on back where you really belong. You are always welcome home, welcome home. You've been kept down for much too long. I should refer to Fraser as the chair. He looks like a chairman. You know? And then uh, my own brother, Thad, and then Professor Boche, used to be my student. He's now the head of department, so I'm under him. Um, and as to quote our current president, fellow Ghanaians, that's a quote. When um, 
Peter sent me something about this as far back as, was it October, November, that he was very determined to do this program. I remember when we opened this place and I happened to be here. And at that time, I think I was the chair of the Museums and Monuments Board. And uh, I drove myself down, just like I did today. And I had fewer gray hairs. 20 years now, the gray hairs have multiplied. Very soon, I'll be a piece of, a piece in the museum, if I'm lucky. If I'm also lucky, I'll be enshrined in some memories. After a while, when those who know me also go, that memory vanishes. But it was because of memories that I happened to have met Tad's father. One day, I was in the house, and my mother called me, says, it's nicer in Fanti, but I'll translate into English. One of the people who were with Nana Kobnan Kasia the Pope had come. And that is why I feel so delighted to be sitting in between two of Nana Kobnan Kasia's nephews, Fris and Thad. But before we get there, when I saw Thad choose the topic, topic museums, museums, memory, and community engagement. I said that it's only somebody who deals with psychiatrists who would choose a topic like this. So this is a topic that really affects the brain. In fact, if you don't work at Ankafu, you may not understand the topic very well. And when he was introduced to me, he says I'm highly educated. In fact, it made me sit up and ask myself, what is the meaning of highly educated? So please, I think that was a mistake. I did it what? The white man's knowledge, the black man's knowledge, or what knowledge? Probably, I'm highly miseducated. So it depends on his miseducation to think that I'm highly educated. But the, 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 the um, thing that got to me was, I remember Secretary's phrase or his statement. People are eternal, whilst the individual's life is transient. So always focus on the people. And it's in focusing on the people that I believe that Thad wrote this particular um, theme for, uh, for us today. We all know what a museum is. In fact, most chiefs in Ghana are like museums, right? See the way we dress and so on and so forth. And you can see that that's an archeological piece Certain there. So we always remind you about some centuries ago, and then we wear these uh, fake ornaments and also fake gold. Am I right? But some of them are real. And so we sit there, and then you think that they are gradually going into oblivion. But um, fortunately, I chaired the Museums and Monuments Board, so I was forced to pay a lot of attention to the museum. And of course, my good brother here also chaired the Museums and Monuments Board. Right now, I'm the deputy chairman for the most important museum in Africa, besides those in Egypt. And I'm praying that the Java Museum also rises over time to that kind of museum. And that's a museum built solely with the funds, with its personal funds, by Koansa in Sekondi, Bisa Abroa. And the name Bisabrua is so important that if you don't know the symbolism, then you have to go inside before you go to Bisabrua. There's no museum like this anywhere in Africa. But how many of us go there to see? So please, make use of the museum in order to jog both your memory, you know, uh, your memory and so on and so forth, and the idea of community engagement. By talking about Tad's father, when I was reflecting on him as I was coming, my mind went to the fact, the sad fact. Anytime I'm coming, crossing the river, either into Elmina or from Elmina to Sekondi, I remember what the joke they used to have. And the joke was that, the sacred you, Nasser, was here now, what that name down here, Nadina, Ibiasu, Nasser, 
was in our chain in don't get sick just tells you about how close these communities have been over time but most important when you cross the pra something tears inside you you can't believe that this important river on which we went down to the estuary in order to sprinkle the ashes of uh, one of the greatest singers that we've had in the 20th century um oh the name would come you know we went and sprinkled the ashes and at that time the river wasn't like this but now any time you cross it you say no this cannot be Ghana this cannot be the Ghana you knew perhaps before i depart and join that's father the face of the river may have changed but as i was coming this morning i've been to a funeral already i've been to a deba when i was about to go to the funeral then it was announced that christian achu had passed off and i shook my head mainly because not because it was christian achu but because he was connected with the black stars and you'd wonder why i say that because of the social consciousness of people like Tad's father at a point in time when i was a child there was the black star boys at a skado and we formed the black star babies that was the consciousness at that time and that consciousness was created by a group of young boys so that i'm referring to your father as a young boy who who were part of nana's people like um Fraser's father and that consciousness the youth had was the consciousness that created this country that we are in called Ghana the liberation that came was out of that black star consciousness at a point in time which came so talking about the black stars and today the christian i you in my mind as soon as you forget people's names they stop being ancestors but so long as we remember their names and mention it and that's why i'm so happy being here today when my mother said oh nanan kofuni we talked we loved he had come from zambia we laughed and so on then i said i'll come and interview you at the time i was ready or getting ready i had that the memory and every african being what he is is a living museum but that memory had moved that landscape to quote kizebo had eroded you know into the ancestral framework and i was happy when they decided to immortalize his name connected to his java connection now talking about that to so this is me praise this one is to you you know that and come on time to go and open the museum the Ghana National Museum the eve of independence it's something most people don't on the eve of Ghana's independence they open that museum and then he went to make the iconic speech which most of us listen and we shout yeah where he said certain things and one of the most important things that he said which is very important today and connects with memory connects with museums he said we have awakened and we shall sleep no more these were the young men who were awakened unfortunately the rest of the population fell into a coma the following day and up till today we are still in a coma and it's up to builders like this memories like this to reawaken us and bring us back to who we are supposed to be the new african the new african and he doesn't just talk there he says and most important it says if ghana will be left alone will be left alone i forgot in the day to come left alone by whom 
The people sucking your blood did not want to leave you alone. And that's what we forget. So whenever I hear people talk about independence step by step, so the mosquito is sucking your blood, they say, please do it step by step. In the 1920s, they referred to Ghana as a model colony. Anytime I read that, I feel like crying. A model colony is a model slave. And people refer to it, oh, we were a model colony. You know, and they say it with pride. We have lost our independence. I don't know what we are going to celebrate on 6th of March. You tell me. Are we going to celebrate the fact that we have lost our independence and now we are under the directions, the directions of, 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 no, of Kenyans? Yeah, it's, it, it, it tells home better. Where did we go wrong? What has happened to us? Where is this consciousness that people are being in heart? Where is this consciousness that people like Kobe Baini had? I was very lucky. I'm one of the luckiest Ghanaians at the moment. It's also among the saddest because I grew up at a point in time when men and women walked with pride because they were independent. They knew what freedom was. Do you understand freedom? Are you prepared to die for freedom? It's either freedom or death. It prefer self government to danger than servitude in tranquility. We thank God that we haven't fought though. Now we have two major tribal parties. And on the even for independence, come on wonders. We should be careful of tribalism. Look at Europe. They are fighting tribal wars. Tribal wars today. And they will tell you that you are the tribe. As a warrior war, Ukraine and tribe, 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 tribe. And they are fighting. Under the guise of whatever you say. Did we listen? So being here today and coming to museums, memories, and community engagements, I always look at even the things that we parade as the semblances of independence. The only important day with regard to our independence, and I'll tell you this, and I'll say it over and over and over again, was on the 7th, 8th of January when positive action was de declared in this country. Why? Very simple. We had Nibonis inflation fight. It wasn't about independence. Then the ex-servicemen also caught up. It rose and brought about consciousness of who we are. Then we had the ex-servicemen also marching. They shot them. They had shot the ex-servicemen in, in uh, Dakar before. But they were marching, telling them, look, you promised us this for fighting for imperialism. We we're not fighting for independence. They went and fought for, their, for our subjugation, but they didn't understand. Because the propaganda was good. Then the railway men and all the guys rose up one day, said, we are tired of oppression. Get out. That was positive action. Why don't we celebrate it? Because no oppressor wants to remind the fact, you of the fact that the people can rise up against oppression. So don't celebrate it. Since then, one oppressor after the other, and you call them a band. And the oppressors are divided into two. They've divided the nation, and the youth cannot get together collectively as the movement created by people like Mr. Nabe Inals and uh, R.P. Bafo in second day. They were not divided. Today, if any of the young person rises here, they will call him what? Oh, he or MPP. Leave them alone. Even if the NDC man is hungry. Tell you, he or he or he or he or he or he NDC. Even if they, they don't know that we need to come together. We need to come together. They were together. So having the Java Museum is a reminder, not just of the man who is there, but the fact that we had a history. But the history is about the Java connection. It's about our colonial, pre-colonial. We haven't left coloniality yet. We are still sinking in coloniality. So therefore, 
to even talk about post-colonial is, is we're not there. We talk about neo-colonialism. You know, sometimes when I read in Puma's speeches or listen to him, I ask myself the question, who ever taught this man the meaning of colonialism? Because what he says as far back, you know, quoting people like Desaline in the 1950s, it's remarkable. Then you ask yourself, but how did he know this? How did he know this? And that is why the change was come, uh, the change he made. And that change, whether we like it or not, is recognized throughout the African world. All of them, he was a liberator. The first person to refer to him as a liberator was E.K. Datsun in concerts. You know, when they were doing their, as in way, a concert party, eh? Kroma the liberator, telling the white man to go. Of course, the white man never wanted to go, and he's still here. He hasn't gone because he's in your head. He's in your head. All your institutions are what? Based on the white man's model. All your economics. And when you are taking a loan, when you know that a loan is going to inhibit you and put shackles on you, you happily go and take the loan. There's something wrong with our heads. Not my head, not your head, our heads. And this comes out of coloniality. And yet we don't know. We are not aware. So having Java telling us that we are somebody before this, it's a memory. I, for example, I carry so much in my head that sometimes, just like I'm doing, I want to impart it to people before I go. And I'm ready to go though, you know? to get people get in there. Sometimes I look at the money phrase has and I see the big six and I ask them, but why them? If you don't know why them, then the money becomes a piece of paper which you use. They arrested five people in Accra. Nobody battered an eye. They arrested one person in Cape Coast and then Sakis Kek got the, the young ones to do monsoon. But the leadership of the UGC is even there. Was in second D. And that was Park Grant. No Ghanaian questions and asked, but why was Park Grant not arrested? And his deputy was R.S. Blay. You never ask yourself, dancing a one to one. They couldn't arrest them because of this man's father and the youth in second D. Because they went and told the general manager of the railways, if you touch any of our men here, we will down tools. That's all. So they left, they left background. Later put him on the house arrest. Then people don't even know. Frank Wood's father, who became Wudu, went ahead, organized the railways, and they went back and told the, the white man after doing that, he was part of it, as an friend, and were the underground press. They went back and told the railway manager, if you don't release these six men that you have detained, we will down to us. Then it led to the negotiations and then the face saving Watson Commission. Face saving. And you've detained them. So it to go into the memory of museums or the museums of memory to relearn. You know, nobody gets liberation because I say, if I, even the word we were granted independence, as soon as you it granted by who? Freedom, either you take it or you leave it. They had no option. All the rest was what? Pure fa fa la fa la fa la fa la. And then we had we began the process of independence. Of course, things went a certain way, and people like his father had to run away to Zambia. <laughs> you know, but probably they kept their memory. And I'm thinking that he passed to third. And that's why third works in Ankafu from time to time. So this is it. But the social consciousness is important. And the museum is what we need. The memory is what we need to lift up a community. So you can't have a museum 
living in a vacuum, staying in a vacuum. When I walk down the streets of Eskadu, for example, I know who stayed here, what the person did, I know who stayed there, I know what he did, and so on and so forth. The young ones don't even know. In Sekondi, we had three circles. One was called Independent Circle. Today, those of you who know Sekondi, they call it Enamasi. I said, what does it mean? But the name was Independent Circle. Then you come to the regional office, there was a little circle there. Named after the workers who were responsible for our independence. And Anthony Wood sent me a message before he passed. And that could we build a statue of Kobe Bainé in this place. And that was called the Workers Circle. Then you come into a schedule yourself, and there's a circle. And people were calling it Jata, Jata, and so on. When I came, and I told them, it is not called Jata. On the eve of independence, I said, people were shouting in Accra. We were in a schedule lifting the flag. And that circle was named Positive Action Circle. Those of you who have been there, and there's a lion inside. And when Mr. Kuma brought the, uncovered the lion, he said, Iskado, what you, net kawana waden jata. Iskado wasn't me. It was the railway workers from all parts of Ghana. And they were the lion. They were the leopard. It included his father. Now that's a memory. If I go off right now, I take this away. And all they say is Jata, Jata. The rebellion against the system. How many of you are prepared to rebel today against the system? How many? How many are you willing to die for the country? When you reach a stage, when those who even go into the army, the young boys sometimes have to pay a bribe in order to go and die for Ghana. We need to rethink. And these are the, the Java Museum is among the things that is going to help us to rethink. Unity. The Java people were sent to, to Indonesia, if I'm right. They were Asante and Burkina Bay. But now they are Ghanaians. And they are not just Ghanaians, they are El Wayed Nafu. It's better to put it that way. This man, he has nowhere to go. If he leaves at night, we come to his cattle. That's the way we are. We absorb respect because we share a very common culture. And we share not just a culture, we share a very common African philosophy. Social, cultural, political philosophy. I always ask the young boys there, he might be NDC, he will tell you social democrat. And I'll tell him that he should go to the beach and explain what is meant by social democracy to the fishermen in front. Ten years, he won't be able to do it. You move off into Kajetia. There they vote MPP Mubwana. So they are liberal de democrats. All of them are liberal democrats. That tells you that what we are doing, when you hear say, and so long as we follow a path that is not our own, but it's the museums like this that will remind us about who we are, where we come from. In learning, one of the teachers that I had, oh, he didn't teach me, but that was Professor Menome. Somebody I respect a lot, divine D.E.K. Menome. One day engaged in the conversation, we spoke about the fact that at Independence, we wrote that we have a history. That our history, we wrote it in the framework of the white man. Now is the time to decolonize that history. I, for example, never use words like empire and so on because I don't know the fancy equivalent of empire. So I'd rather talk about a civilization or a cultural thing. But never, I'm very careful because if your past is colonized, it then means that your future will, stay, will still stay colonized. And these are the things that remind us about who we are. Where is the Asafo spirit? Do we have it? One for all and all for one. Where do we have this? The UGCC had that as their motto. In 1948, 1947. 
Where is all for one? All for DC or all for NPP? Where's where's Ghana? Where is Ghana? These in the Gold Coast were the Ghanaians. In 1948, there was Ghana United, the best football team. There was no Ghana then. Ten years later, Ghana came. But the people were referring to themselves, Ghana United. We became Black Star Babies because the elders were Black Star Boys. And who are the Black Stars? Marcus Gavi. Who reads Marcus Gavi today? I rise. You know, you might raise, you can accomplish what you will. Are we rising or we are sinking? Where's Gavi? Whenever your enemy tells you, don't read that book, don't study that philosophy. That is the philosophy you study, you read and you study. Which of our institutions has put down Gavi's philosophy and opinions as his own? But they were reading it. In the 40s, they were reading it. What happened to us? Where is that revolutionary spirit that carried Africa? As in Bacon was saying, Ghana was the Mecca. That everybody has to go and learn about liberation. Today, you come to Ghana to learn how the IMF can get a country. How about some of the ways you had to? That's the challenge of Java. That's what I call it. And that's the challenge of today. I'll be highly honored. You have been asked to cross many rivers to, and streams to be here. My only sadness is that I cross the Pra in such a state. You know, the reason why I say I cross the Pra in such a state is that my holy water is the Pra. A lot of people don't know some of these things. My holy water, my sacred water, the sacred spirit from my father's side is the pra. And I don't want to see it in such a state. I should be drinking it. I should use it to wash myself on my krada, my krada, my birthday. Not this white man's birthday that with his Gregorian calendar, once a year, happy birthday to you. That's for Stevie Wonder. I know my culture. I know my calendar. And these are the things that will help us to recover who we are until we restore ourselves as Africans, as his father was. The humility he met me. I couldn't believe it. It was many years ago, 20 years ago plus. You can imagine how young I was, how handsome I looked. And then this elderly man stood up for me. You know, when you are cultured in a particular way. It becomes embarrassing. Oh, but you're now also, oh, no, 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 no. You are now our chief. And he stood up till I had sat down and then he sat down. And then we talked. And I said, I'll come to Elmina and find you. I'm in Elmina because of his memory. And I feel highly honored to be here today. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much. Nana, we are also very honored to have you in our midst. And I'm sure you have given us a lot to reflect on. Memories. Uh, some of them are happy memories, but many of them are nightmares, as you have quite rightly um, um, demonstrated. So we'll have a short break, and then our next speaker uh, Professor Di Valera Boche will be ready. Thank you.
Well, um, thank you very much for Rhythm is Power. And um, our next speaker is ready um, to give us his uh, presentation uh, within the theme that we have chosen today. Um, Professor De Valera Boche is the head of the history department at the University of Cape Coast. And as usual, he has um, a short bio in the um, program. And you can familiarize yourself with his background and his academic interests. And I'm sure he has, I'm sure he will not miseducate us today. <laughs> All right. Um, good afternoon. Um, I'm happy to be here. And um, I want to bring to the conversation that we are having today about museums, memory, and community engagement, uh, my reflections, basically, about uh, the praxis of public history um, within the context of the creation or our quest to create a deeper understanding of the historical consciousness uh, that, as a people, we should have not only in Ghana, but also the African nation as a whole. Um, I just want to make a, a quick joke before I proceed. Um, I've got two videos that I would like to, I thought I was going to have a projector here, uh, but unfortunately there is none. So I will play two videos. Uh, I'm sure that we can all make sense of the, of the audible part, not the visual part, and then we can contextualize it. Before I go on, uh, Nana, please, with, with your permission, um, you made mention of the fact that um, there is, well, you made mention of a word, and you said, oh, it would be good to have the fancy equivalent. I would like to know if there is a fancy word for museum. Well, of course, he talked about empire. So, um, did, did <laughs> yes, yeah, so we have to get our linguists to work, or we have to go back in the time to tap into our history, um, find out if our ancestors did have spaces and places where some important items of our people were kept. Um, not to depend on the word muse in order to give that place that kind of Greco-Roman, you know, label uh, that we use today, which is museum. But um, what I, I think we are dealing with here, which is museums, um, the title being museum's memory and community engagement involves a certain intentionality where as a people we try to educate ourselves using different spaces and places which can include our schools our universities our museums as we have them here our historical sites like cape coast castle and the rest to sharpen our historical consciousness, just as regular people or as professionals. As an academic, I have been trained to promote history through academic history. But apart from academic history, there is also something called public history. Um, and so when we talk about public history, we do have to avert our minds to something which is very democratic. Um, as an academic historian, I can study their methodology, um, their pedagogical approaches to use in order to communicate historical information to the public. I can do that, maybe get a certificate in it and step out to, do, to, to teach people in the public spaces, the public domains here at the museum. 
at a Saint Manso at a different uh, historical sites. But there are also some people who have not had this training and they are there. Either they are members of talk, talk, talk companies or they are members of these satellite, you know, uh, locales of the GMMB, which is the Ghana Museums and Monument Board, trying also to teach people about the African past, not only to Ghanaians, but Africans who visit these spaces and diasporic Africans who return to these spaces to learn, to learn about their past. What you find happening there is that The sending of knowledge, and I put it in inverted commas, from certain peoples who are supposedly knowledgeable in the history of Ghana, Cape Coast, Elmina, Kumasi, Asin Manso, the transatlantic slave trade. However, having you know moved around quite a bit and listening, I've come to the realization that at times, some of the information that these people who are supposed to be our public historians uh, convey are not really historically accurate. And that is wrong because history is sacred. And history is not something that you conjure. History is based on facts. History respects evidence. History happens in time and space. History's got nothing to do with spirits. However, you hear some of these people spinning and creating fantastic stories that are not historical. However, if you go down to look at how some people think, okay, the past should be converted to, to people in the present and kept for posterity, they draw on what you call memory and not history. When you deal with memory, you choose to remember, you will to remember. What do you remember? And from what do you draw this memory from? So I find a lot of people who are supposed to be our public historians dealing with memory. And I believe they are, at times, they feel empowered to, to, to create these fantastic tales, as I mentioned, because of a certain mentality that a scholar like Pierre Nora uh, you know, uh, Pianora is a writer, and he's, uh, he, he talks about memory. Where he, he made mention of the fact, talking about memory, said that, and I quote him, that the atomization, in other words, the splitting of a general memory into a private one, has given the obligation to remember, has given us all the obligation to remember. However, he goes on to say, it gives everyone the necessity to remember and to protect the trappings of identity. And he goes on to say, when memory is no longer everywhere, it will not be anywhere unless one takes the responsibility to recapture it through individual means. My, my focus is on the last part where he talks about the fact that we have to take the responsibility to recapture it through individual means. For me, I think that that is what has given some people the license to endeavor to find their own ways of recapturing memory, which means that you can even create fantastic stories about the past without necessarily paying attention to history because you just want to remember, you just want to bring something from the past. And I think this is very unhealthy. It's unhealthy for spaces like the museum, like the slave dungeons where people go to actually get history, like the Asin Manso to get history, and they go and people make up these stories. I'll play some of these stories. That's what I have on my videos, two of them, and then you will know what I'm talking about.
when we talk about museums, having said this, then it is important for us to really have experts. We have to get people who are knowledgeable to, to convey information about the past to the people in the present because history can give a person self-possession or it can give a person self, can dispossess a person. The knowledge is very important. So if we have people who are experts, who are trained, who respect the sacredness of, 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 of history, even as they play in what Pierre, Pierre Nora referred to as um, Lieu de Memoir, which is places of memory, they still respect history. You do not sacrifice history just because you want to remember. So at this juncture, let me play these two videos um, and we listen to what some people who are paid by the taxpayers' money, people who, you know, the young and the old visit to get historical knowledge, uh, give to the people in the name of drawing on memory and also um, um, in, in the name of giving them history. Perhaps after this, we can have a conversation. Perhaps we can call this pseudo history when we, we hear what they have to say. And these are from two places. One is from Asen Manso, and the other one is from uh, Fort Prinzenstein in, 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 um, in Keta. Okay. in the central region, the story is told, for example, of how the country, and particularly along the coast, evidence So, um, we ready, and this one is coming from Asin Mansu. We know the, the significance of Asin Mansu, the, the, the river there, and what uh, persons of African descent go there to do, and the information that you want to get from this space, which is a Leo de Memoir, a place of memory. But a place of, it's a historical site too. Country, and particularly along the coast, evidence of the European presence in the slave trade in the 14th century abound. And just as Ghana bears the marks of colonialism, many parts of the Americas, Europe, and elsewhere also carry proof of aspects of the culture of enslaved Africans who, until their sojourn, knew no other way of life. From the ancestral river park at St. Manso in the central region, the story is told, for example, of the Caribbean country of Jamaica was named by Akan slaves. The term Jamaica, as it refers, it's in the indigenous people who name it as Jamaica. But it was the Akan speaking people, the slaves who were captured from Jamaica, looking at the terms of condition that they found themselves. Then they say, wow, it seems this place that we have come, we have come to stay permanently. Perhaps we have come to stay permanently. In our conversation, we say Jama Yaka. Jama Yaka. Jama means perhaps to stay permanently Yaka. So Jama Yaka. So continue pronunciation, they anglicize it and make it Jamaica, Jamaica, Jamaica. Okay. Thank you. So this is the first one. It's a video that I obtained from um, YouTube. And uh, before the tour guide, the male voice that we, we heard as a tour guide at the man. so before he came in, there was this newscaster, and it was shown on GTV. This was shown on the national television. So we should consider the, the, the seriousness of this. This is something that is distorting history. And it's, it's someone who he was being paid by taxpayers' money to educate us. Now, is he playing with the idea that memory has been atomized and so we can just draw on anything and make stories? Because if he had taken his time, he would have got facts and information about the name Jamaica. You cannot say because enslaved African people were taken from, and also I think at times is this whole idea to feel empowered. You know, you, you don't need to, 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 
to put yourself out there in what we call romantic romanticizing the African past to say that yeah everything came no the facts are there if you say Jamaica which is perhaps we are, we are stuck here the question is did you take your time to find out what the indigenous people of the land called the land before Columbus went there for example if you talk about present-day Bahamas it was known as Guanahani the indigenous Taino people refer to it as Guanahani. Someone goes there and is, he, he turns the name into, turns it around and now it becomes Bahamas. You go to Haiti, the indigenous Taino Arab people refer to the island as IT, land of mountain, right? Columbus, pre-Columbian period, before Columbus, this was the name. Columbus and the people goes there and they call it Hispaniola, right? IT has a meaning in the Taino language. Jamaica has a meaning in the Taino language, which is Jamaica, which is land of wood and water, right? So for you to teach people as, as a public historian at a historical site, and I'm making mention of this, I am drawing our attention to this because we're dealing with spaces like this. We have to educate people. We have to really give them historical information and not to, to, to falsify information and memorialize things which are un, untrue. Then we have a problem. It is going to be perpetuated. It's going to be carried on into the future and then it will become, as Google said, if you repeat something, if you lie to a people over and over and over, Google's being the propaganda secretary for Nazi whatever regime it becomes truth. This is not right. So I found this and I said, wow, wow, what is this? What is this? This is what I think we need to do, looking at public history and how it can give self-possession or it can dispossess, how it can empower, it can disempower. Write public history is very important for us in shaping our historical consciousness in Ghana and also in the African diaspora. The second video that I'm going to play is from Fort Prisenstein in, in uh, Keta. And again, this is, this is um, someone who is operating within the space of Liu de Memoir, place of memory, place where history must be respected. Okay. Money, stay from, stay from. Work from, work from morning. He worked from morning to mid, to, to midday. And then the slave masters were tired. They need a midday rest, so they put the gun down. They go and sleep. So the slave would be in chains and shackles, watching the gun. They thought if they make any move, the gun would shoot by itself. So the same applied to spectacle. They would hang it. They thought the white man is having four eyes. If two is sleeping, two is watching. So I'll take you don't have time, so let me. Okay. And sometimes those places where I've been sent up first for sexual abuse. Even somewhere. Uh, please, did you hear that one? Uh, what the, 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 the tour guide said to, to international you know, visitors, um, people from the African diaspora, young ones from Elmina, uh, Esikado, um, Kumasi, and the rest going to learn and they go there and the tour guide tells them that lesson the enslaved people will be kept in a corner and the european the white enslaver uh will place the musket there and tell them that if they move the musket will kill them will shoot and kill them and the enslaved people, because they are, I believe we can put what he's trying to convey there, will just be sitting there until the, the, the white enslaver will, you know, will return and pick up the musket again and control them. The second thing is that at times the enslaver will hang his spectacle up and say that the spectacles is watching you. An enslaved person, who's an African, like your ancestors, your grandfathers, will be there, not knowing that this is an inanimate object. 
that what is their level? What is their mental, you know, um, what's the level of their IQ? What are you trying to say? What are you conveying to the young ones? And it's not as if it is historically correct. If it's historically correct, that's fine. Because history is sacred. Yes, they did this. The fact is there. But this is not historically correct. And so, as a person who, who is, 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 is practicing public history, producing public history, you cannot do that. The fact is, before even this fort was built, <laughs> if he had taken his time, he would have got to know that before the fort was built, people here had used the musket already. They had engaged in wars, they had used the muskets, they knew how the muskets were. And so for you to just sit down and say that the, the, the gun will blow your head off if you, do, if you move, and repeating that lie. And of course, this is drawn from, from another ethnocentric story that has been in existence. Yes, for a long time, it, and, 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 and they, they are now these public historians who are supposed to know better are now trying to reify a new one which will be at the national level instead of the ethnic level. And this is very unhealthy. As, as an academic historian who at times steps into, into public spaces to, to speak to people, I find that I'm not always out there all the time. That space belongs to a certain group of teachers. And what are they really giving to the, to the people? If Java Museum and the rest are all going to be these places of memory, places where people go to, to, to learn, then it's important for us to really, really get people who are knowledgeable, experts, who understand that history is sacred. And you cannot just reify fantastic tales and stories just to fill the gaps. If you can, don't have the facts and evidence available, just leave the gap as it is. And that is, that is how we will have a good historiographical space, a good historical place for ourselves, and we'll become historically conscious. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Boche. I think we all have examples of these stories. You go to various tourist sites. Uh, the Jamaica one I'm familiar with. I've been a victim of it myself directly. <laughs> and um, there's one that I also, I think, will share with you briefly. Uh, at Cape Coast Castle, just before the gate of no return, there's the female slave dungeon. And the guy has this theory that um, the, you know, of course, all these um, people were traumatized, raped, etc. That is a given. But his theory was that all the people who had European names in Ghana were children or descendants of women who had become pregnant and had been released into the town. And I said to him, look, this is, this is, Unfortunately, a woman in that situation was an article of commerce. And these people were not interested in releasing a woman because she was pregnant. As a matter of fact, she was pregnant, then she, they had bought one and got one free. Exactly. And, and this, you know, so they just make up stuff. <laughs> and when I, I he said that they are kept there for three months, I said sometimes a woman who is pregnant for three months herself does not know she's pregnant. Yes, and you, you are saying that they'll come and get a, a woman who's three months pregnant does not show. And, you know, but none of this is based on fact, as uh, Professor Boitre is saying. So we have a lot of work to do at our, our places of memory. Thank you very, very much. So our next speaker um, is going to be uh, with us shortly. I just want to make sure that our Zoom is still working and I don't see it, so we may have lost the connection. Anyway, we may have lost it.
Yes, uh, we're back now. Uh, bear with us, those of you in more technologically advanced locations. Uh, we lose our connection from time to time. So right now, our next speaker is uh, Dr. Emmanuel Gamo, uh, who is a lecturer at the uh, Koforidua Technical University. Uh, he also has a bio in the program, and in the interest of time, I'll introduce uh, Dr. Gamo and invite him to join us here. Honorable Fritz Bafo, Prof. Bochi, yeah. ladies and gentlemen, thank you for this invitation for me to share a few things regarding the integration of museums into tourism. And I'd like to make a short presentation, and I hope it to be very short for all of us and very educated. Us. When I was giving his um, address, he made mention of a number of things. The first thing I picked, I picked up was whether we are misinformed. And Professor Boche also made mention of something. We are being misinformed. But how are we going to solve these things? If the very institution educating us, the public, and educating people who visit us from other places are misinforming us. This is a very important question because we would like to try to find out how important museums are to tourism. And to begin, I'd like to say that museums play a very important role in tourism because they are part of the culture and heritage of a particular people. And as such, museums provide a window for people who visit other places with, with the information about the culture and history of that destination. They also serve as poles of attraction, pulling people to other places where they would like to see things, learn new things, and even improve upon their knowledge. If so, then we say that museums are custodians of history, heritage, and at the same time, they are the disseminators of such heritage to people, especially the public. Now the issue comes again. How then do we make sure that we are not misinformed? Anyway. In 2016, at a conference, a presenter known as Subakti and his colleagues alluded to the fact that Museums are very important attractions that arouse emotions and experience of visitors. And at this point, I can say Nana sitting here is more like a walking museum because he was able to arouse my emotions as he was telling stories. Professor Boche also made mention of certain things that arouse my emotions. That tells us how powerful museums are and what museums can do. In this sense, this group decided to find out something, and they therefore explained that museums perform a very important task of seducing a traveler's memory and also being the instrument of appreciation as well as learning. So we can see that what Prof. Boche said is very important, such that we are supposed to guard our minds not to be misinformed. If we are, then we carry along the memory of misinformation and therefore relate to other people in the cultural um, landscape in a different way whilst we're supposed to link with them or liaise with them in a specific way. In doing so, we get to see that museums are therefore places of collective memory. As Prof rightly said, it's a place of memoir, memory. So we get to see that museums are places that we visit. Most of the time, people from the diaspora are those who visit such museums often because they would like to link up with their heritage. And linking up with their heritage, they link up integrating the community into their memory and also bringing out the issue of community engagement. How then do they start engaging with the community? 
if they don't know the heritage. So museums are eye openers, they are windows where people are educated and given information that we are supposed to be understanding. Now we can identify this and we say within the Ghanaian context, it's very interesting that although Ghana is viewed globally as one of the most important and the best destinations for cultural tourism within West Africa, the full potential of the culture and heritage through museum tourism is yet to be tapped. In other words, this potential is untapped. For us to be able to tap this full potential, we should identify and understand that Ghana is blessed with rich heritage. And this rich heritage therefore places Ghana at an advantage. Ghana is surrounded by countries, for instance, Ivory Coast, Senegal, the Gambia, and even in East Africa, Kenya, having this, a similar resource base. Therefore, we say that they have comparative resources. But Ghana, what sets Ghana apart and has set Ghana apart over the years is the presentation of museums, differentiating us from places like the Gambia, from places like Nigeria, from places like Ivory Coast. Ghana is able to provide such an emotional story that links people from the diaspora to those here in Ghana. As yeah, the various addresses were given, we get to see that everything is being linked to diaspora and everything is being linked back to Ghana, such that we have relatives in Suriname, we have relatives in the Netherlands, we have relatives scattered all over Africa. So we get to see that the potential that tourism can give through museums have been fairly untapped. With this, we get to see that museums are great ways for us to be able to channel this information and tap this knowledge and improve on our memory as well as opening up engagement with the community. We can see that tourism is very important to the economy of Ghana, but museums are often seen as non-core component of the tourism industry, which I believe is sad. The question therefore becomes why? Why do we have such issues springing up? There are several reasons, and over the years, there have been compounding issues that are stopping Ghana from maximizing the potential of museums within our tourism scale. And I am very happy to meet two giants of our museum industry who have been able to lift the museums and monuments board to be giants such that anywhere you go in this country you are likely to find something about museums or monuments. One of these main reasons over the years have been the lack of integration and coordination between different stakeholders within tourism and museum development. Also, we had the undevelopment and inadequate marketing of many museums, such that a lot of them were unappealing to travelers who come to the country and even to Ghanaians ourselves. Interestingly, a good news came up. The good news is such that efforts have been made over the years to be able to improve the situation. For example, the Ghana Museums and Monuments Board and the Ministry of Tourism, Culture, Art and Creative Arts are working together to promote a collaboration between these different stakeholders in tourism and the museum sectors. Also, over the years we've seen from the 2012 onwards, we've seen an improvement in the quality of museums such that museums are places to go. Now we say go to places for tourists have been, have been the issue of museum. And for example, over the last few years, just about two years ago, 2021, in June, there was the rehabilitation of the Osha Fort Slave Museum and Documentary Center, which I see to be a great fit. This was supported by UNESCO. And with this, we can see that 
we have a lot of opportunities to be able to share our history and connect with people within the community, bond with them, and make sure you give them the right information. Not those like Jamayaka and the others that we heard from the video. Ghana finds itself in a strategic location which museums are able to differentiate us from others. They have served as element of tourism supply, differentiating us from our competitors, as I said earlier. Unfortunately, the applause that they deserve are yet to be given to them. And people who made it so are also yet to be honored. Now we turn our attention to find out the importance of integrating museums into the tourism experience. Now we look at tourist experience as a concept. And throwing back, we can see that museums and tourism are said to go hand in hand. Meaning, when you mention museum, there is an element of tourism. If you mention tourism, there's an element of history, heritage, and monument. And therefore, museums are still very important in our sector. They play a very significant role such that they are able to put in place the emotional touch and the memory of people through folklore and also giving us tangible things to look at. When we entered the Java Museum, I went around and I saw things I've never seen. I learned a lot of things I've, I've never heard of. And as things were being said, I realized that the working museums of Ghana are not appreciated. We need to be able to tap this for us to develop our tourism industry. Unfortunately, the significant role that museums play in tourism is just in the incipient and has not been properly explored, not only in Ghana, but all over the world. It has been proven in 2021, in 2012, and in 2007, significant years, by a lot of researchers and supported by UNESCO itself. Integrating museums into tourism activities will help us gain a lot of things. First, it will improve the quality of the tourist experience. And improving the tourist experience, it also improves their level of satisfaction and therefore brings us the issue of return visits. Return visits accompanied with word of mouth. Then more people visit our museums as the core attraction that we need. The integration also increases our length of stay, something that we don't take a look at. The more or the longer people stay in communities, the more they spend. The more days they stay, the more money they spend, the more the economy grows. We need museums to be integrated properly into our tourism sector so that we'll be able to increase their tourism experience, increase their length of stay, increase their expenditure, and therefore, by extension, we will improve the standard of living of our communities and our country so that we don't go borrowing unnecessarily, as Nana made mention of. Tourism's, tourism has a very good reliance on museums such that they generate a lot of income for communities they sit on and also for the whole country. So for Java Museum, I know it will do a lot for the people of Elmina and to also do a lot for the people of Sekendi, surely. Although I've read about Java Museum helping people who are not even indigents of Elmina. This tells us that Museums are very important, and we have to create opportunities for it to be integrated properly into our tourism sector. Again, there are opportunities created by museums. For instance, creating job opportunities, which we know definitely people who work here, some of them will definitely come from the community in and around Elmina. It creates this and improves the living standard of the people within the community. So museums are very important. It also creates important connections and opportunities for the local people as well as businesses to be able to be engaged. I will say that they, for the involvement in the designing of ideas and storytelling in authentic and right way. 
without the community, without the museums, you may have a lot of stories, as Professor Boche said, trying to disenfranchise us from our own heritage, giving us things that we are not supposed to consume. In recent years, we see that there has been an increase in the trend of integrating museums in our tourism sector all over the world. Example is Italy. Another example is Cyprus. North Cyprus, South Cyprus have integrated museums into their tourism sector such that whenever you visit any area, you are bound to visit a museum and you take a piece of their heritage with you and then you become the ambassador and the evangelist to spread the good news about their heritage. Ghana needs to do the same. And in Ghana, we see this as special things and it's especially evident in the castle museums where the museums are a major part of the tourism being consumed by the people. So it becomes a major component, but we usually see it as major component in the, in the castles. So the castle museums become major component of tourism consumption. They can also be a great source of entertainment and education. As we can see, we are being educated on our past. We have folklore, which are sometimes corrupted. However, we get a good piece of the history and therefore we are identified by it. And then we go on to try and leave such um, heritage in the present. Now the issue of experience. How then do we blend experience economy into the museum experience? And from the museum experience into tourism experience? This experience economy came about recently as a result of the quest for unique experiences by tourists in the engagement with museums and other tourism facilities. With this, we get to see that with the same time, same resources, same equipment, and same people, tourists are still demanding for unique experiences. Otherwise, they move on to other places. Unfortunately, this experience economy that we've gotten into helps us a lot, but it also serves the same way as pulling down the demonstration that we do in our various museums, such that it reduces the services that we provide and also reduces our resources that we have in order to help provide such um, historical uh, pieces. The demand is high, but the resources are pretty low. And with this, it increases the financial pressure that is on the various museums to be able to give us what we are supposed to know. So we can imagine how Java Museum has been under pressure to give us such unique experience when you enter such unique education, such unique thing that brings chills down your spine. You see pictures, you see monuments, you see history written in short notes, yet it brings you a lot of memory. It brings you a lot of your own emotions being stepped up. Museums provide a lot, but they are unique because they provide us with both the tangible and intangible um, product. They give us subjective experience as well as objective things to take along. Museums are places you can get few souvenirs and also provide you the opportunity to relive the experiences that your ancestors and the ancestors of other people went through. With this, those who come from diaspora experience this at the castles, and some of them weep uncontrollably after they go through the process and come back from the gate of no return. You can see that it arouses their interest, and they are able to even consume some souvenirs, which will give the community some sort of income. For museums to be successful, we are supposed to be able to integrate it properly in our tourism experience. They offer tourists a combination of experiences. However, there are various theories that we use to make it non, uh, a typical academic, not to be a typical academic presentation. I'd like to just summarize that particular um, 
theory. And this theory was by Pine and Gilmore in 1999. In 1998, they brought up the first one, but in 1999, they polished it up and brought us a very good one. They said that museums and other tourism attractions are supposed to give experiences that are both involving, that are absorbing, and that are participatory. For museums to be able to give outstanding experiences, we therefore need to be able to grant unto the people who visit those museums an absorption, we grant them immersion, we grant them participation, which will be either active participation or passive participation. With this, we get to see that museums are able to provide us with entertainment. When they pose as elements giving us absorption as well as passive participation, sitting back and watching things or seeing things unfold. It also gives us some sort of education. Watching from afar but still engaging with the activity or engaging with the monument. It also grants us some escapism. People travel because they want to escape from their normal routine. They've worked for years and they're tired. They need to get out somewhere. It grants us that escapism because it immerses us in the olden stories or in the folk tales that we have. And it makes us participate actively in those activities that are being presented to us. Again, gives us aesthetics. Now we see a lot of monuments being shown around. Those are things that we can capture in our heads and ensure that we have the experience that monuments bring, the experience that museums bring, and therefore enrich our tourism lifestyle and also enrich our experience that we get from various destinations. For us to be able to gain unique experiences from museums, and therefore enrich our tourism experience, we need to be able to be entertained by the museums. Again, we should be educated by these museums and not miseducated, as we've seen in the previous presentation. We should also take away certain things, images, artifacts, by way of buying souvenirs, taking pictures, and having memory pictures, or we can say photographic memories. Then also, it should be able to grant us escape from our present time into the olden days to understand how our people lived, but not to be able to bring us way down to the point that we think that with things that make us think that when we see a gun or a spectacle being hung somewhere, it is something that we should be afraid of, that if we move, the gun will shoot us or the spectacle will arrest us. We should be able to be granted some escape from our present time, to be able to relive what our ancestors went through and what the ancestors of other people went through. With this, we say that it's quite tough for museums to do all of these. And there are various challenges, and these challenges can be addressed when we are able to understand and ensure that the quality of museum exhibits is high enough to meet the expectations of the tourists. Also, we should be able to make it a point to have enough trained, well-trained and qualified staff for them to operate and provide good level of service and knowledge. As has been demonstrated by Professor Boche, we are being misinformed a lot of times by public um, educators of museums, history, folklore, and other things. Again, we should also consider how we are going to market the museums. Marketing of various museums are very important. So we try to integrate it in tourism by helping market these museums, adding it to our various components of tourism products to be marketed by the Ghana Tourism Development Company and other marketing boards that we have so that it's going to be very appealing for the potential tourists who are to come and for those within our countries who are going to be present there. What I mean is for the international and the domestic tourists, for them to have good experiences and exhibit with quality education and entertainment, for them to have good escapism as well as having aesthetics. Now we talk about the takeaways. Why do we have to integrate museums into tourism? 
Tourism is about visiting places of interest. Tourism is about learning about our forefathers. Tourism is about learning about new things and new monuments, new artifacts, as well as the old ones, to enrich our lives so as not to be lost people in this world. Tourism is very important, such that we should always try to integrate it into our tourism activities. If we market various attractions, we should add museums to it. If we market the Elmina Castle, we should add Java Museum to it. If we market the Cape Coast Castle, we should try adding Java Museum and other museums to it. If we market places in Secondary Takrad, we should add places like the Orang Fort Orange to it. In other places, Fort uh, Apollonia, Fort Bast Battenstein, and all of those things can bring us good memory. And they can be able to be laid to us by these um, museums. Again, I'd like to say that museums are not places where we get lost, but places that we find ourselves. So as Nana rightly said, and I'd like to ask again, have we been able to be awoken by what we hear, where we visit, and where we go to? If so, are we going to sleep again, or are we going to keep awake? And also, as Professor Boche said, we should try get the right information and help our people understand the past and the future, where to go and how we got here through quality education and right information. With this, I'd like to end here and still acknowledge that museums are the most important pieces of places or pieces of things that we get to learn about the past. We get a peek into the window through which we are shown the culture, heritage, and the people's lifestyle over the years. Therefore, we should try and always integrate museums into our tourism offerings. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Gamo. Um, it will take me another lifetime to achieve what you have laid out without any help from anyone else. <laughs> but uh, you're right. I mean, what we aim for in this museum is that it is a repository of stories of our lives, um, of our past, and truly history is the basis of identity. And if you don't have a good sense of who you are, then development will elude us as a people. So really that captures what the Java Museum is about. Now, um, we will attempt to cross the Mediterranean and see if Dr. Van Kessel is ready in the Netherlands to give us her presentation so, uh, Dr. Van Kessel um, is uh, retired from the University of Leiden. Uh, her background is in journalism and history. And she is actually the individual who brought the story of the Java soldiers to life here uh, in Ghana through her research. And so, we are very happy that she, uh, we're very happy to have her uh, present the stories that are uh, related to this, uh, to this gathering, and she was one of the people who was here 20 years ago, so he's 20 years older, as I said earlier. Thank you. Oh, thank you, Seth. Can you see my PowerPoint presentation? Uh, not yet. Try again. Launch meeting. Share screen. Yes, something happening now? Yes, something happening. There you go. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you and good afternoon, uh, everybody. Um, the title of my presentation is The Shattered Community, it's the Black Dutchman in the Dutch Colonial Army and their descendants. And it's a real privilege to participate in the festivities of the 20th anniversary of the Almina Java Museum. My thoughts go back to the opening of the museum in 2003, when I was in the company of a 
delegation of six belong the Hitam. You see them sitting here at uh, uh, St. George's Castle. Belanda Hitam is the Mal Malay expression for black Twenty years ago. I want to take a moment to commemorate the extraordinary couple, Dan Cordes and his wife, Evelyn Cordes Kling. Dan Cordes died a year ago at the age of 99 years. His wife died in 2018. And they have been driving forces in the Indo African community in the Netherlands. When I was writing my book on the history of the Black Dutchman, the Belanda Hitam, Mr. and Mrs. Cordes were valuable sources of information. And subsequently, we also became good friends. We traveled together to Ghana in 2000, and we returned in 2003 for the opening of the museum. In the meantime, we had linked up with Professor Olsen, who discovered that one of his ancestors had a history in common with the Cordes family and the Klink family. What they had in common was a period of army service in the Dutch colonial army in the Dutch East now Indonesia. Corporal Manus Olsen was among the very first army recruits in 1832. He returned to Elmina in 1836 with a leg injury and an army pension. In contrast, Retired soldier Cordes and retired sergeant Klink opted to stay on Java. They became part of a small but lively Indo African community. I want to take us briefly to a rough outline of the history of the African soldiers and the later generations of Indo Africans, and then dwell a bit on the notion of community with the question. Is there still an Indo-African community? This is the rough outline of the story. Between 1831 and 1872, some 3,000 African recruits sailed from Elmina to Batavia, that's now Jakarta. That's the capital of the Dutch East Indies. This is a bit later. Um, the Dutch colonial army experienced a chronic shortage of European manpower. The African soldiers were counted as Europeans. After their contracts expired, some returned to the Gold Coast, where the majority settled in Elmina. These veterans were allocated plots behind St. George's Castle, on a hill still known today as Java Hill. The pensions were paid out in the castle. Java Hill, you can see here on this tourist map, this hill behind the castle is still known as Java Hill. And this is a picture of Java Hill before the restorations of the stairs. Others, having established families during their long years of army service, opted to settle in the East Indies. And they became the founding fathers of a small but lively Indo-African community centered around the Javanese towns of Puerto Samara, Salatiga, and Solo. An army career became a family tradition. Many sons and grandsons of the African soldiers also served in the Dutch army. Like all colonial armies, the East Indies army also recruited native regiments in the Indies and Pakistan. Army policy dictated, however, that roughly half of the troops had to consist of Europeans, who were deemed more reliable and better qualified. The African soldiers were counted as part of the European contingent. Their conditions of service were mostly the same as those of Europeans, and considerably better than those of the indigenous soldiers. In due course, the Indo-Africans became part of Indo-European society. They spoke Dutch as their mother tongue, their children attended Dutch schools, and they held Dutch nationality. Recruitment started in 1831, when the governor, Governor Last in Elmina, 
received orders from The Hague to recruit a company of 150 African soldiers. And if the experiment would prove satisfactory, recruitment would then be organized on a more sustained basis. Instructions from The Hague emphasized that recruitment had to take place without coercion or force. The governor invited the king of Almina to the castle, and the king promised to cooperate, but he also made it clear that he could not force his subjects into army service overseas. Uh, what you see here is a troop ship. The voyage from Almina to Batavia to Java took about three months, and of course it went around the Cape of Good Hope. The first three ships that were sent from Holland to Almina in 1831-32 collected only respectively 18, 19, and 7 recruits in Almina. And among them were the sons of several well-known Afro-European families in Almina and Accra. Jan Nieser, Willem Nieser, Manus Olsen, and Willem van der Puy. Manus Olsen was the great-grandson of Rolof Olsen, a governor of the Dutch West India Company in Elmina from 1755 to 1757. This first batch of 44 African soldiers took part in a military expedition in southern Sumatra. Initial reports about their qualities as soldiers were highly favorable. Reports from Batavia to the Hague stated that the Sumatrans were full of awe and admiration for the Africans, and that prompted the Governor General in Batavia to reiterate his previous request for an entire African regiment in the Dutch East Indies. So plans were made to scale up the operation because recruitment in Elmina delivered only a handful of recruits. So the new scheme started in 1836 with an official mission, headed by General Jan Trofeer, that's general, arrived in Almina with a vast array of presents for the Asantehene, Asantehene Kwakodua I, and with instructions to arrange for the enlistment of between 2,000 and 3,000 soldiers. Along the coast, volunteers were few and far between but it was hoped that the Kingdom of Ashanti would be the key to solving the manpower problem. The Ashanti, since olden days, had been on friendly terms with Elmina and with the Dutch, and it was a traditional supplier of slaves, of manpower. Provere was accompanied by a very large delegation of hundreds of men and women, and arrived in Elmina with a vast array of presents. Uh, Arrived, sorry, arrived in Kumasi with a vast array of presents, ranging from liquor and guns to perfume, silverware, sweets, crystal, a clock, and a camera obscura. They were well received by the Asantehene, and the presents were much appreciated. On the 18th of March, 1837, a contract between King Willem I of the Netherlands and Kwakodua the first of Ashanti was duly signed. The Asantehene would deliver a thousand recruits within a year. He received two thousand guns by way of advance payment, with a promise of four thousand more to come. Moreover, the Dutch obtained permission to open a recruitment agency in Kumasi, which for the next five and next few years would be headed by Jacob Huydekoper, a mulatto from Almina. This is an African soldier from Java. Recruitment was still supposed to be voluntary. So slaves offered to the recruiting agent received an advance payment to purchase their freedom. On arrival in Almina, they were given an act of manumission, of proof as proof of their legal status as free men. However, recruitment in Komaski never met the Dutch expectations. In the first year, the Asantehene delivered only 51 recruits. 
The efforts of the recruitment agency were somewhat more successful, but still remained far below target numbers. The Ashanti would only sell a few of their slaves to the recruiting agent when they were in need of cash. Most recruits were of Mossi origin, or from other regions north of Ashanti, and generically known as Donko. They were registered in the uh, army recruitment books, and in most cases, in many cases at least, the origins say only Donko. Uh, along the coast, of course, there is a greater var variation of origins, and uh, here you see, among others, Fanti, but also Donkey, Donkos. So meanwhile, recruitment also continued in Elmina. All in all, between 1836 and 1842, some 2,100 African soldiers left Elmina for the East Indies. Recruitment was first suspended and then abandoned altogether in 1841. The British government had protested that this mode of recruitment amounted to a covered form of slave trade. Here you see an African soldier on Java, and you see he was meant to be frightening, and that was indeed the effect. Africans were, of course, bigger in posture than the Javanese people, so they made a, a big impression. And they lived with local Javanese women, very much like the Dutch soldiers in the colonial army used to do. They could take their wife within the army barracks, and there they would live as a family, which indeed was much encouraged by the army command, because the soldiers were believed to be more stable and less drunken when they could live with the family and the army barracks. The African soldiers here were reputed to be very fond of their children, and on Sundays they went out for a walk or promenade, showing off their costumes and their wife and children nicely dressed, and this probably is a picture of a Sunday walk, a Sunday promenade. Here you can see that the African troops were treated different from the native troops. The guy on the right is an African soldier, and look at his feet, he is wearing shoes. The guy on the left is a native soldier, and he is barefoot. And this difference in status was also very important for the African soldiers. They jealously watched that all their privileges were duly observed. And in fact, whenever there was a breach in the promise of equal treatment, there could be protests and rebellions and even mutinies. There were several mutinies by African troops in the Indies, in most cases because uh, the promise of equal treatment with the Europeans was not being observed. And these mutinies led the colonial administration to doubt the wisdom of the African recruitment scheme. But on the other hand, quite a few African soldiers chose to re-enlist for one or more terms of two, four, or six years after the expiry of their initial contracts. They were generally regarded as loyal and courageous, but ill-disciplined in combat. Yeah, this is uh, an African Pete Klink, who is from the Northern Territories, north of Ashanti, and here you see his Javanese wife. This couple lived in Samarang, that is the eastern part of Java. Here you see how frightening the image of the African soldier was to the Javanese. This is a Wayangolek puppet. The uh, Java, island of Java has a long tradition of puppet shows, and Puppets depict the Dutch colonizers, obviously are depicted as very ugly, with big noses and red cheeks. And here the Africans, this puppet obviously is an African soldier, who looks quite frightening. The soldiers were used in Quite a few wars. This was the most notorious war in Dutch colonial history, the Aceh War. Aceh is part of northern Sumatra, and this was a very protracted, protracted war that lasted for several decades. 
Several African soldiers received distinction medals for their courageous behavior in the Aceh War. This, for example, is African Corporal De Leo, and this is Corporal Yang Koi, who is actually from Elmina, and he has also a range of medals. This is the most important one, the Military Willems Order, which is the Dutch equivalent of the Victoria Cross. So he has the highest distinction the army had on offer. After some reconsideration, recruitment was resumed in the late, nine, in the late 1850s, but on a smaller scale and with more precautions to ensure the voluntary nature of enlistment. Between 1860 and 1872, another 800 African soldiers sailed from Elmina to Batavia. Recruitment ended with the transfer of Elmina to the British. Arrangements were made for the continuation of the pension payments, while the veterans retained their right to plots on Java Hill. Here you see pictures of family life, Indo-African families on Java. On the right, you see the Javanese grandmothers. Uh, and this is the main person. Uh, the Bild family, he was a very influential sergeant, I believe. And here you see one of the young, this young girl I had the good luck to interview for my book, and she was very old but still had a lively memory of the life in, in this case, the town of Povarecho. This is another the family. Lump is another Indo African family. This one is a Dutchman, he married the daughter of this family, and here again you see the mix of Indonesian and African features. And here is Doris Lund, who is the main, is the family head on this picture. This is an interesting picture from the town of Samara, the Komais family. This would be the second generation. And here you can see that the soldiers have risen to quite respectable middle class status in colonial society. This family picture also features a babu. A babu is the Indonesian maid looking after the children. So having a babu and having various other domestic servants was a sign of having achieved middle class status. This is the same family again with the babu sitting here on the floor, minding the little kids. An Indo-African wedding, and this is a Klink family. You see that uh, this is very much like a European wedding, a Dutch wedding would be on the island of Java in colonial times. This is the Cordes family, the family of Dan Cordes, whom I showed you at the very beginning. Now Dan, I believe, is here as a young man. Uh, yeah, yeah, this is Dan. Uh, his two elder brothers both died in the Second World War. And Dan was a much younger man. Dan was uh, conscripted. He was not a career soldier. He was conscripted at the outset of the Second World War and he had to join the fight against the, Jap the Japanese occupation forces. So Japanese occupation of Java and the other islands lasted from 1941 to 1945. Dan, meanwhile, and many of his fellow soldiers were made prisoner of war, and they were uh, brought to the Burma Railway. They had to work on the notorious Burma Railway. Many of them did not survive this experience, but Dan was by that time appointed as the hospital soldier, so he had to look after his fellow prisoners and did not physically have to work on the railway. The end of World War II did not mean the end of army service, because in 1945, when the Japanese were defeated, the Indonesian nationalists, led by Sukarno and Mohammed Hatta, proclaimed independence. 
but the Dutch were not willing to recognize Indonesian independence and start a colonial war against the nationalist forces. And the African soldiers, still part of the Dutch army, also took part in this war against the Indonesian nationalists. Until 1949, when the Dutch were finally forced to recognize Indonesia's independence, treaties were signed and the Dutch East Indies Army you know, was dissolved in 1950. Initially, most of the Indo-Africans in the Netherlands had to spend their time and energy on finding jobs, finding houses, finding their place in society. But by the 1980s, there was a uh, new initiative to link up with former acquaintances from the towns, of, towns on Java. So since the 1980s, a biannual reunion was organized, uh, and that offered an occasion for old timers as well as for the new generation born in the Netherlands to explore the gaps in family history, and of course also to enjoy Indonesian cooking and African music. Now here you see an Indo-African reunion, uh, the ladies all nicely dressed in uh, batik and wax print uh, dresses and draperies, um, which was very uh, um, nicely provided by Jan van der Heijden, who will be one of our next speakers, because Jan at the time worked for Frisco, and Frisco, of course, was the main producer of Dutch wax prints, and he managed to bring a good supply of wax prints to the reunions, and this was used for the African dances and the Indonesian dances, and everybody had a good time. The 10th reunion, held in September 2000, was pleased to welcome a special guest, Professor Seth Olsen, the great-great-grandson of Manus Olsen. And he had traveled from the United States to the Netherlands to meet the other descendants of the African soldiers. The story came full circle later that same year with a visit to Ghana and Almina by Dan Cordes and his wife, Eve Cordes Klink. And they, as I said, were for a long time the driving forces behind the Indo-African reunions in the Netherlands. By now, most of the Blanda Hitlam born on Java have died. For the past 10 years, there have been no more Indo-African reunions. For the generations born in the Netherlands, the Blanda Hitlam is distant history. Thus, we are now confronted with an ironic situation. While the Almina Java Museum celebrates its 20th anniversary, anniversary the Indo-African community seems to be slowly fading away, which makes it even more important to cherish this landmark of an extraordinary history. I just, this is the important landmark, and I skipped here the Olsen family in Almina, which is part of the African half of the story. The other pictures show the Indonesian and the Dutch part of the story. And this is where the history is kept and preserved. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much, uh, Dr. Van Kessel. Um, as you quite rightly observed, the memory of Africa in Indonesia and Netherlands is vanishing, and we are struggling to keep it alive on the continent of its origin. And um, it's great that you were able to share with us the journeys of these African men, 3,000 of them through Indonesia, the Netherlands, and some of them who made it back home. And uh, we hope that the Java Museum will continue to be a repository of different aspects of the history of people of Elmina as we go forward. So thank you very much. I think um, what we'll do is, uh, I believe Jan van Heiden is with you. 
Is that right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so so Jan Jan I think we'll go on straight with you and then we'll come back to Ghana after that and have Rabbi Kohini close us out with a transatlantic slave trade part of the story. Um, so Jan is a gentleman who has worked for many years with Vlisco and as you can see Vlisco is represented in many different ways. The wax prints that we all wear here in West Africa and he'll be able to share with us the history of, and origins of how we dress, the stories. Again, we do so many things without knowing the origins of what we do and uh, what place it has in our psyche, our minds, our behavior. And uh, we hope that we'll be able to put all the pieces of the story together today. I would like to take this opportunity also to remind everyone that after the talks, we will have two short theatrical enactments, one being the arrival of the Portuguese and the other being Jan's defiance, which led to his exile in Sierra Leone for many years. Uh, then we will have dinner, and actually during the theater presentations, we will have beverages other than water. So just hang on. <laughs> Um, I also have just been reminded to remind those of you uh, who are not familiar with my book, Java Hill, An African Journey. There are copies available here in the museum, and that also ties up uh, the stories. Really, uh, the book is uh, a family historiography of Ghana. It tells Ghana's history through 10 generations of my family. So if you are interested in reading, then that's something you can do. I'd like to uh, introduce our next speaker, who, uh, to my mind, is the representation of the return of the diaspora to Ghana from the Western Hemisphere. In, in the person of Rabbi Koheni, who, Halevi Koheni, who is, um, we have a, a thing going. Rabbi, when I come down, he says, oh, are you still over there? Uh, I was forced to go over there, and I escaped and came. So I don't know why you've put yourself there, and you're still there. So it tells you the, the dilemma of uh, our, our lives here. Okay, I hear he just had a fresh grandchild to add to Africa's population on this side. <laughs> Okay, so uh, please welcome Rabbi uh, Cohen, who is also the executive director of Panafest. Please, Rabbi, we are happy to have you. He will be speaking about the transatlantic slave trade, memories of that, truths and untruths. sit in this big seat here. <laughs> Thank you, Prof, so much uh, for the introduction, and most of all for organizing uh, this event uh, with Java Museum. Um, to our Nana Chair, our distinguished Nana Chair, and to all of the distinguished personalities that are here, um, standing on all the protocol that has been established, and to all of our guests here in person as well as virtual, I greet each and every one of you and the spirit and soul of uh, February African History Month, even though it's every day for many of us. Um, it's my pleasure to be here to share a small portion of today's program, but I think a very large subject matter, um, transatlantic slave trade, memories of transatlantic slave trade, truths and untruths. Um, Prof gave me a lot of room with this title. Uh, it's such an important subject matter um, to touch on. No way can it be exhausted um, this afternoon. When we think about the memories of the transatlantic slave trade, it covers so many areas, the heights, the depths, the widths, the breaths, conjured up in our memory because our memory has been so clouded with the untruths that is very hard to distinguish the truths because 
there are some who have made up proper proper and a theory that if you tell a lie often enough, people will accept it as truth. And I think that's the closest I can come to thinking about the memories that we have transatlantic slave trade. That there's so many so many so many untruths that have been told throughout the years that it has actually captured our minds as if it is the truth that many of us who look at the transatlantic slave trade even from the title itself transatlantic slave trade you don't mention any of the perpetrators nor the victims when you say transatlantic as if the ocean is guilty of something or we're accusing them of something and um, we don't mention any names or people as I said the perpetrators get away the victims are invisible and somehow we have to try to um, change all these narratives, shift the paradigm so that the truth will emerge and nobody can escape it. I was listening to a program just this morning, not really a program, but someone had sent me um, something on social media and it was a testimony of an African American woman at a school board meeting in the United States in William County, Virginia. And she was so, so perturbed of an experience that her child had in school. And in the United States in particular, I know that we have a global audience here, but in the United States in particular, there's been a great argument being waged. It's not just the U.S. The latest um, form that has taken on is this idea of critical race theory, which has been rejected, you know, for the most part by many academics in the U.S about the curriculum and the syllabus of the history of the slave trade, the history of Africans, the history of racism in the U.S. And this particular parent happened to work with the Central Intelligence Agency and the Archives Department. And she was there before the school board saying how her daughter was taught in the classroom. The question was being asked then, what was the identity and what were Africans before they turned up here in America as slaves? And the answer that was given to the daughter, the student, was that it's unknown. Nobody knows what the identity and what, the, what, what were the Africans and what did they do before they were slaves, arrived as slaves in America. And the hypothetical answer given was, they were probably servants and slaves anyway. And this is something that was done most recently. This is within the last month. And the parent was so perturbed that the teacher would pretend that there's no history of who Africans were before they were captured and enslaved and sent to what was called then the New World and particularly to the United States of America. And this is a dilemma that we have. What are the memories of the transatlantic slave trade? And the memories usually are that Africans were an inferior people, enslaved people with no history, no language, no culture. And this has been packaged very well, propagated even better, and accepted, unfortunately, um, by too many people. Unfortunately, even too many of us, we of African descent. And so it's time that not only do we search out these truths that have been swallowed up by untruths, but find a way to package them to not reinvent ourselves, but to, in fact, to retell our truth to the world by us, for us, that these things can be unraveled and then we can be repackaged because a lot of the problems that we face in Africa, a lot of the problems that Africans face outside of Africa still are related to this episode in history that has never been told from our perspective. And many of us have never taken the laborious task of even learning about it ourselves. We still are stuck in the tunnel of stereotypes that Africans sold Africans into slavery, Africans are to blame for, the sla for slavery, and that all we have is Europeans were good businessmen and good business partners and saw a good deal, took advantage of it. And these Africans who were technically just many of them captives of war, criminals, found themselves being sold by their own people and ended up in the new world with new identities 
and uh, they never really had any culture, any history worth remembering anyway. And that's how too often it is sold, especially outside of Africa. So this idea of memory is very important because it's like remembering. And remembering, in my mind, is not only the psychological re retention of facts and um, episodes in history, but it is also remembering, putting back together scattered parts. If you were to dissect a body and you were to take the body and separate it in different places, remembering that body would be putting that body back together again, putting the members of the body back together again. And when you see one of the things, the tragedies of the transatlantic slave trade was the scattering of the African family and scattering the African family to almost to the four corners of the world, but mainly to the West, scattering the African family even on the African continent. And then with the advent of colonialism, which is most of the often separated from the slave trade, where they belong together, then we see the sk further scattering of the African continent and African peoples. So remembering is also putting the scattered pieces back together again, the scattered pieces of the African family back together again, along with the psychological ret retention of our history and the episodes that caused that scattering. So when we see the identities of the Africans now in the diaspora, when we speak of African-American, when we speak of Jamaican, when we speak of Trinidadian, when we speak of Brazilian, too often we speak of it as if we are separate from Africa and we are new people and new identities and whole theses and whole doctrines have been made of that. And forgetting the fact that these over 350 million Africans who now live outside of Africa are actually Africans whose identities were taken, stolen away from them. And I've had the opportunity on many occasions to bring different members from the diaspora um, through the experience of the dungeons in Elmina and Cape Coast. And when I take them, especially into Cape Coast, because you have real dungeons, because the time that it was built after Elmina, over 180 years, the slave trade was at its height. And so Cape Coast has real dungeons that you descend down into. And one of the things I remind our brothers and sisters before we go there, I remind them that not a single African-American was captured on this continent. Not a single Jamaican was captured on this continent. Not a single Brazilian or Trinidadian was captured on this continent. We find that we were captured in our original identities, with our original culture and name coming from original ethnic groups that were here. And going down into these dungeons was the beginning of manufacturing new identities to fit into a new world. And so now it is that those who were captured and had those identities reconstructed and manufactured have forgotten that they're Africans. And even our African families that we were separated from have forgotten that we were Africans. And yet and still the price that those who are in the diaspora pay as second class citizens doesn't have anything to do with the intellectual capacity, doesn't have anything to do with their character. That has to do with the fact that they originate from Africa, and once they come from Africa, they have been devalued. They've been devalued because when your identity is stripped from you, your Afri it can't be stripped from you without your Africanness being stripped from you because the Africanness was our identity. And no human being can be of full value when they don't have their identity. So therefore, the connection of the African family, which some of us are trying to promote through Pan-Africanism, is an essential aspect to the recovery of our mind, the recovery of our memory, the putting back together again of the parts of our body so that we can be whole to begin the journey of liberation. We cannot be liberated without that exercise preceding it. We must recover our memory, we must recover our mind, and that's an exercise that must be um, exercised in by both Africans on the continent and the diaspora because we both have suffered to some degree from this tragedy and from this trauma. And we've had no break from the trauma. We've had no sustained effort. This is not to discount the initiatives and the efforts that have been done by courageous men and women throughout the ages, by even organizations and by institutions, but no sustained effort for the African to come out of his traumatized experience and to be retrained re, um, and to recovering himself. What do I mean by retrained and to recovering himself? In other words, we must acknowledge that you cannot go through an exercise of enslaving a free human being or colonizing an independent um, people without it taking a process to do that, to accept that condition. And so therefore, to be totally liberated and free and independent, to be independent as a colonial, former colonial power, 
and to be free as a formerly enslaved person, there must be a process that one goes through of recovery from the trauma and from the reality of what it took to put you in that position to be fully recovered, to be able to master your own destiny and chart your own course. And we have not had that exercise in its completion. Most of us who have been educated, most of us who've been exposed to experiences that we can enjoy some modicum of independence and freedom have, have done it through being educated and exposed to European institutions. The same people who put us in the condition of trauma are the institutions who have had to monitor our growth and graduation through their systems to be free individuals if such a contradiction can really even happen. So the idea that the truths and the untruths about the memories of the transatlantic slave trade, the it is perpetrated and has infiltrated every aspect of our societies. When you put together uh, the academic um, the academic exercise that have been going through and studying this subject matter, documenting this subject matter, which many of us who study it have to come across, you find that academics compromise their integrity to make up lies about the African in order to justify the, their moral position on why it was all right to enslave human beings of African descent. People made up false scholarship. People made up false statistics. They said the African had no retention trait. The African had smaller brains. The African could not learn properly. The African could not govern himself. These are theories that are still being thought about today, still being propagated today. We had the clergy, we had the, the, the theologians who actually mistranslated the Bible, who actually said Africans were cursed black, that Ham was cursed black. They, nowhere can you find these things documented in the Bible, but you had people graduating from theological seminaries based upon false doctrines to relegate the African to being second class. These are all memories of the transatlantic slave trade. Because if you, if you want to justify sustaining over 250 to 300 to 325 years of an assault on a continent to actually capture people and to enslave them, how do you sustain such a thing without having a total cooperation in the societies that were perpetuating it? So whether it was the governing structures through kings and queens and, 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 and the academic structure of scholarship, through the religious structure of theologians, all conspiring together to be able to reclassify the African outside of the human family. So you can have tourists coming to Africa today in 2023 that will still ask questions and have speculation in their mind about the people they will meet. Will they meet people here living in trees? What kind of food do we eat here in Africa? Do Africans really have an association with monkeys? You had the first family of the United States of America and the person of President Barack Obama and Michelle Obama who was subjugated in the 21st century to being associated Michelle Obama with a monkey on Facebook and on social media, meaning questioning their humanity, questioning their integrity based upon stereotypes that have been held over from the transatlantic slave trade. This has to do with memories. This has to do with truths. This has to do with untruths of the memories of the transatlantic slave trade. This has to do nothing with their intelligence, nothing with their character. Because when you measure up their family, when you measure them as individuals, there had been no president or vice or, or a president, vice president, or first family in terms of their moral standards, as far as we know, that could match them and all the presidencies that preceded them. But yet and still, because they were of African descent, because they had African blood, they had to be brought into question about their very humanity. And people accepted these things as okay, because again of the legacy of the memories of the transatlantic slave trade. So when we look at the mere fact that today, again, um, in the United States of America, you have just the United States, not talking about any other country in the Western Hemisphere, there are more men of African descent that are incarcerated in jail than were enslaved at the end of slavery. And we must realize there's a connection with that. Right now, as we sit here, there are more prisoners in the prison system in America of men of African descent that are imprisoned than there were enslaved at the end of slavery. Something is wrong with that. If we still have black youth finding themselves marching through major cities of the United States of America saying black lives matter, something is wrong. If you have, look back at the civil rights movement 50 years ago, 
and black men and black women were walking through the streets carrying signs, I am a man, and man was equivalent to human, meaning I am human. They were still trying to throw off the stigma of being African and therefore being inferior, and with something is wrong with that. Something is wrong when you have the kind of abuse that has taken place in major cities around the world, and then we have not, not one, not two, not three, but over 54 African nations, and Africa is still silent about what's happening to her children abroad and in the diaspora, with over 350 million of them still suffering from the abuse of just being of African descent and having African blood running through their veins. So these are subject matters, as I said, that we must continue to keep in the forefront, continue to keep in the forefront of discussion. It's no shame if people do not have to apologize for remembering the tragedy and the trauma of other people, and it is all right to discuss it in history, Nobody should ever try to convince us, neither should we ever accept being convinced that we cannot talk about the slave trade. And that it's, it's, it's the past. And why do we keep bringing it up? Because the past directly affects our present. And so in that respect, as I said, <clears throat> we can never exhaust this topic in one afternoon, in one session. But we must use every opportunity where any platform is created to make sure that we speak to this topic and make sure that we do so with a sense of commitment and determination that we shall be free. We shall be liberated. It doesn't mean because we have a flag that we're free. It doesn't mean because we got a national anthem that we're free. It doesn't mean that because we have a pledge of allegiance that we're free. We must understand what liberation and what freedom really means. Free means liberation and dumb means mind. So freedom really means liberating our minds. And that is the exercise that we must continue to complete in order to complete the liberation struggle for freedom. So I don't know how far my 20 minutes go and how much I've used up. But um, <laughs> again, um, we must do this. I think that, again, in trying to round it up, the greatest tribute that we can give to Asaji Po Dr. Kwame Nkrumah is what the Saji Fo Dr. Kwame Nkrumah gave to Honorable Marcus Garvey, what the Honorable Marcus Garvey gave to those who inspired him. I'm mentioning those three names. I can go on and on, but I'm talking about continuity. Continuity. How we cannot afford to forget those who came before us. And I'm not talking about just speaking in memory, but living out the ideals and the principles that they laid down and gave their lives for. If you go back to uh, the scriptures and the um, New Testament, they have a statement that Yeshua, whom we know as Jesus, told his disciples that the things that I am doing, you can do an even greater. He didn't mean that there would be a greater miracle. He meant that you're going to live beyond my lifespan. And because you're alive, you're going to be able to carry on a work that I'm not going to be able to do because I'm not going to be here with you physically. That means you have to carry the work on. And each one of us that are alive today are agents to carry the work on of those freedom fighters who are not here with us. The greatest tribute we can give to them is to finish the work. They started something. They didn't finish it. They were cut off. Some were assassinated. Some were assassinated um, uh, psychologically. Some were assassinated uh, metaphorically. Some were assassinated physically. Some were isolated. Some were not wanted in their own homes, understood in their own families. But they started something. It was a spark. A spark is no good as a spark if it doesn't become a flame. A flame is no good as a flame if it doesn't become a fire. And fire must be consuming. So we must finish the work. We must be Asaji for Dr. Kwame Nkrumah. We must be the Marcus Garveys. We must be the Martin Delaney's. We must be the Nana Kwame Dejan. We must be all the heroes and the heroines, the, the men and women who dared to give their life to stand upon the principles of being proud to be African men and women. We must live those lives. We must be those people. We must let their DNA and the blood that flows through our veins that is the same as theirs manifest in us in our actions and our everyday commitments. So if they were proud enough to live, we must be dedicated. And if they were proud enough and dedicated enough to die, we must be proud and dedicated enough to live. I met an old man when I was younger. I didn't say I'm old now, but I'm older. And I met an old man when I was much younger. I just had a few black hairs on my chin, not these white ones here. 
And it was a time in the 60s, late 60s, and we had a lot of our African men and women heroes that were being assassinated. And we lived through that generation. And I know I had fire in my eyes and, you know, in my blood and wanted to be a part of the struggle. And he said, let me tell you something, young man. We've had enough martyrs. We have, we have proven that we have the men and women who are dedicated to this cause who are willing to die for it. But right now I'm looking for some young men who are willing to live for this struggle and really willing to carry on the work. He said, any fool can die, but it takes a wise man to live. So be one of those who are prepared to live for this because we already proven we've had the men who are prepared to die for it. And although you may have to face that, and you may have to taste that. Be one of those who are willing to live and dedicate your life. And that's what we need, those who are willing to live for this truth and live out the legacy of those who came before us, who paved the good way, who set a good example, and they wrote down a plan that we can follow. So let's do that. Let's be that. Let's become that. So thank you very much. I hope I didn't talk too much and over my time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rabbi. <laughs> Thank you very much um, for touching on so many aspects of the scatterings of Africa. Um, you know, I, I always have this conversation uh, with uh, other African Americans in the U.S. because it always comes up. We have been trained to view each other with suspicion. Um, you know, Africans to view African Americans with suspicion and the other way around. And eventually it will come up as well, but you sold us here. And I always have to say to people, yes, this is trauma that we all share. This trauma, the physical and psychological trauma of being transported to a place you don't know, work for no pay. Indeed, America is a great country, why? Because black people built it and they've still not been paid. Yes, that's right. That's, I always tell my children to remember that. And on this side, during the slave trade, somebody came home and his wife was not there. Somebody came home and his son was not there. Somebody came home and his nephew was not there. That's the story that we share and we have to put it together in one story and share it and go forward. Thank you. So, no, 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 no. yes, you can. So, yeah. So, we'll take a short break uh, for Nana to take a break from us. And Nana, thank you very much for giving us as many hours as you have given us today. <laughs> We're not done. We still have one presentation to go. Uh, it's just the royal break. Folks, let's um, round it up quickly with Jan's presentation, and then uh, we'll take a break, have something to eat, relax, and watch the uh, watch the uh, theater presentation.
Sumeru Young from the University of Cape Coast, Faculty of Arts, the Department of Theatre and Film Studies. I want you all to sit, relax, and enjoy the sketch titled The Meeting. Probably there may not be a break for me to come to introduce the second one, which is titled um, Covenant Gems Defiance. So the meeting is just a brief but significant meeting between the King of Elmina and the Portuguese. Please sit, relax, and enjoy. Thank you. Friendship. 
Your gifts are accepted as a sign of peace. See, see, see. But you have still not answered my question. I said, what do you want from us? Huh? Uh, me. Oh, momento, por favor. Uh, we have uh, come to uh, build a house or a home from home and uh, so that the wine people and your people we can uh, trade, we sell and we buy and we live together. <laughs> Uh, that yeah. sounds reasonable. Acordado? Acordado? Yeah. Uh, Father Fernandez, uh, he just uh, reminded me that uh, for us to have uh, a cordado, uh, a binding agreement, uh, you would have to uh, uh, receive uh, our God as your own. <laughs> you have to pray. What's he talking about? Uh, we, see, we, you mean we have to accept your foreign gods. Uh, uh, we have come there. Yes, yes. Oh, this is a day. We have yes. Uh, we have, we have priests. priests. Yes. Killers. Yes. Who have been with us. Yes. Let me say this before you go here. Yes. You will never accept your foreign gods. Yes. What are you talking about? Yes. Uh, me, me, you. Uh, 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 I want to tell you that our God uh, is very strong and mighty than all your gods. He created heavens and the earth. Um, he's um, known in our scriptures um, as the spring that um, it, uh, it's almighty than all your gods. Our God is mighty among all your gods and even greater than the <laughs> But he is not ready to accept your king, your, your, your God from your far away land. That's your best destiny for you, too. Please, I'd like to address something. That, uh, in order for us to be in the same agreement, uh, your king has to accept our God, else um, we will not have equal ground. And if we accept our God, um, we promise we will be an equal part of this. Yes, and also we will protect you. You are a faraway place. Protection, protection from the people of Shah. No, no, no. Protection. And you will want, you will have the peace that you want. <laughs> you will protect us. Yes. See, mi amigo. That, that, that sounds reasonable enough. Mi amigo. A moment. Momento, momento, momento. Papa God.
Submission. They cut the head of the snake. The British have scattered my people like rats into bushes and the neighboring towns. This is not right.
afternoon and uh, I think that the theatrical performance added a real living touch to history must be alive it must be living it has to be acted out by people in performative ways but we also have to live history in our lives and let it guide our development as a people so I would really like on behalf of board members of uh, Amina Java Museum. Uh, thank you all for spending this time with us. Uh, dinner is going to be ready soon, and so don't just uh, walk around. And if you haven't taken a tour of the museum yet, uh, definitely hit. None of these mics are working. <laughs> yes, I'm just, proje I'm just projecting. Uh, yeah, I'm going to do that. That's precisely what Baba. Yeah, so... Um, I'd like to just uh, introduce three of the board members who are here. Um, Edwin, Mr. Edwin Nakumabo, known as Tom B, in the uh, Adesadol terms. <laughs> and uh, my own cousin, Honorable Fritz Bafo, who has been here with us all day as the co-chair. Myself, unfortunately, Professor Bonzi Simpson, who is the other member of the board, had another engagement in Accra and could not be here. But please uh, relax, uh, dinner should be ready in a, in a few minutes. And as I was saying before this went out, uh, take some time, walk through the museum, uh, ask questions, and uh, we hope to do something like this on a much more frequent basis, definitely before the next 20 years. So thank you all very, very, very much. <laughs> I'm Petra, I'm from Holland. 
I'm a Dutch girl and I was here to celebrate the 20 uh, anniversary of the museum. I see a lot, I, I heard a lot talking about freedom, about Emancipation Day, about the slaves, but also about uh, musea, that in Ghana, the musea is very important also for the tourism, and I think they are right. There are not enough musea here in uh, Ghana. Uh, I, I have uh, enjoyed the day, Sometimes I think, oh, I am Dutch, it's not so good. <laughs> but yeah, I met very friendly people here and they explained me everything. I saw a theater, I heard music. Thank you, it was very nice. My name is Anthony Ananfra, a professor of veterinary sciences in the University of Cape Coast. But I have a very high interest in the history, especially of Elmina. For this reason, I am very privileged to be here to learn part of the history of Elmina. How some Elminians were taken to the Dutch colonies of Java and how after their works there, they became the Bela Hitam, came back to Elmina, started cotton plantations on the cotton hill in Elmina, now called Java Hill. We would like to acknowledge and thank and appreciate the Ozen family for setting up this museum to be part of the historic approach to learning about Elmina. This was not an ordinary meeting, an ordinary anniversary, but it was an educative anniversary where people of diverse views on the history of Elmina, the history of slavery, the history of black Americans were all tapped to educate us. So, that had gone simultaneously with that entertainment part, for which we have provided brochures that we could take some notes. Uh, I learned a lot of history today. For instance, I took the note that there are about 350 million Africans outside Africa who had been in the diaspora due to slavery. Um, it also gives me the opportunity to make inquiries and learn. A lot of slaves pass through Elmina. Let me ask, did the Elminians see it? What was their reaction? Did they oppose it or they were collaborators? I have to learn this. Another thing that I will have to think about is that the history of slavery and our brothers in diaspora is bad. But then, this is a global world. How can we come together to live in an era of reconciliation for the future? But I must also say that I expected that I will see some pictures of uh, Mr. Olsen, in whose memory is this museum very big, and also some members of the family and also some members of the board of Java Museum, which I don't find there. So I would think that you have to be placed there. Nevertheless, I would like to praise, thank, and say long live Java Museum and let us all patronize it. Thank you very much.
Hatın